Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. This is my first visit ever to Slovenia, and unfortunately, I'm only here for one day, but I think I got about 150 pictures already of this on this incredibly beautiful day. And thank you for coming out tonight and choosing to participate in this very important conversation. Uh, how many of you, did you have a chance to see the pictures that I had looping up here before? A chance to, aren't those incredible, those pictures? They're just great, aren't they? I, I never get bored of looking at them. You know, whenever I make new slides, it always takes me so long to find just the right pictures that really convey the essence of what I'm trying to communicate. But not when it comes to pictures depicting the natural connection so many of us have with animals. And especially the connection children have with animals. I always find way more than I can use. I mean, there are literally thousands of pictures out there that really capture that childlike sense of, of wonder, that understanding, that caring. I can tell a lot of you can relate to this. Um, so because I'll be referring to this human-animal connection throughout this presentation, I'd like to do just a brief exercise with you to explore it a bit more fully. I'd like you to try to think of one or more animals in your life who you have felt a connection to. And by connection, I mean anything from identifying with an animal or animals to loving them. Just simply mean caring about their well-being. Maybe it was the horse you took riding lessons on, or a dog you grew up with. Maybe it was your neighbor's kitten, or a hurt bird you rescued. Maybe it was a turtle, or a fish. So I'm just curious. I want to do a quick survey and see how many of you are able to think of at least one animal that you felt a connection to. Just let me just see, hands. How about two? How many of you have ever felt cared about or loved by an animal yourselves? All right, well, that's, that's a whole lot of love. And our experience tells us something important. We care about animals. We feel connected to them. We can see examples of this everywhere. I mean, we teach our children to be kind to animals, not to harm them. We make animals the heroes of our children's stories and the stars of their shows. When we're walking in the woods and we catch a glimpse of a deer through the trees, or when we see dolphins leaping out of the ocean, or when we notice a beautiful butterfly resting on a flower, we often feel that sense of awe that makes us just stop and speak in hushed voices and watch with what some might even call reverence. When we hear of an abused animal, we recognize the injustice and we feel outraged. When we're at the zoo and the piglet or the baby animal chooses our hand to eat out of, we feel special, we get excited. Can you relate to this? I mean, I certainly can relate to this experience. So be before we get started, I wanna tell you a little bit about me and my story and how I came to be here today. That's me many, many years ago now, and my dog Fritz. Um, my mother tells me that we adopted Fritz when he was about two months old and I was about two years old. So we were really both just babies when we met. And Fritz was my first dog and he was also my first friend. We did everything together. We played together, we napped together, we even vomited together once during a sickening road trip. I'm not joking. And Fritz was also my first heartbreak when he died at the age of 13 of liver cancer. And what I didn't realize back then was that Fritz, or more accurately, my connection with Fritz, would become the catalyst for my life's work. And that's what brings me here today. My life's work as a psychologist, a professor, and an author has centered around one key theme. It's a theme that's central to our freedom of choice and therefore to our personal empower empowerment and to social and ecological justice. And that theme is making the connection. So I'm here to talk about our connection with other beings and with ourselves and with our core values and about the invisible belief system, the ism that 
disconnects us from these fundamental aspects of our lives. I'm here to talk about how this ism creates a, a gap in our consciousness when it comes to some of the most frequent and important choices that we make, our food choices, and how this gap causes us to act against our own interests and the interests of others. So I'm here with a goal, simply to raise awareness of this invisible ism, to promote personal empowerment and social and ecological justice. So this presentation will be in three parts. First, we will discuss the problem of the gap. What exactly is this gap in our consciousness and how does it obstruct our freedom of choice? Next, we will discuss the underpinnings of the gap. What causes and maintains this gap that guides our food choices? And what are the consequences of our choices on ourselves and our world? And how does this gap reflect an ism that is actually a social justice issue? And finally, because everybody likes a happy ending, including me, we will discuss the solution to the gap. How can we resolve this gap in our consciousness to make more empowered and just choices? And how can we work to transform this ism that is interconnected with so many of the other isms? So let's get started. What is this gap I've been talking about? To explain the gap, I want to do a quick exercise with you. I'd like you to imagine that you are a guest at a dinner party and the host is famous for her homemade pasta and meatballs. And she serves you a dish that looks like this. I'd like you to consider whether you would find this delicious or disgusting. Now, for those of you who would find this delicious, I'd like you to imagine that you find it so delicious that you ask your host for her recipe. And flattered, she replies, well, the secret is in the meat. You need to start out with three pounds of extra lean golden retriever. How many of you would find, this is my favorite part of the presentation, how many of you find, would find this delicious? I love the expressions on people's faces. There's usually one, two in the audience. Okay, well, if, would you pick out the golden retriever and just eat the pasta and sauce around it? No? Take a moment to reflect on your thoughts and feelings. I mean, chances are what you thought of just moments ago as food, you now think of as a dead animal. I mean, what you just felt was delicious, you now feel is disgusting. Chances are your experience of the meat dramatically changed, even though nothing about the meat itself actually changed. So what is it then that changed? What changed was your perception of the meat. Now our perception is the lens that we look at the world through. And when it comes to eating animals, our perception is shaped largely, if not entirely, by our culture. In fact, in meat-eating cultures around the world, people tend to have a tiny handful of animals out of thousands of possible species that they have learned to classify as edible. All the rest we learn to classify as inedible and disgusting. And so even though the type of species consumed changes from culture to culture, all cultures see, tend to see their own choices as rational and to see the choices of other cultures as disgusting and often offensive. So what's striking is not the presence of disgust. Disgust is the norm. It's the rule rather than the exception. What's striking is the absence of disgust. Why are we not disgusted by the five, six, seven, eight, nine, maybe if you're an adventurous eater, species that we have been taught to classify as edible? And perhaps more importantly, why don't we ever ask why? Have you ever wondered why you might eat chicken's wings, but not swan's wings, or why you might eat leg of lamb, but not leg of kitten. They both come from baby animals. Have you ever wondered why you might eat beef soup, stew, I'm sorry, but not rat stew? Are you getting an appetite here? 
why you might eat mussel soup. We say clam chowder in Boston, where I'm from, but not lizard soup or lizard chowder. Why you might eat hen's eggs, but not pigeon's eggs. Have you ever wondered why you might drink cow's milk, but not horse's milk? And, I know, yum. Have you ever wondered why you haven't wondered? When it comes to edible animals, there is a disconnect. There is a gap in our perceptual process. There's a gap in our consciousness. We don't make the conscious connection between the meat on our plate and the living being it once was. When I was growing up, I was the picky eater in my family. And in my house, we had a rule that nobody could leave the table until their plate was clean. And so, not surprisingly, this often led to some late night standoffs between me and my mother, because my mother would try not to let me out of her sight. And I would wait for just the right moment, when she wasn't looking, to slip my food to Fritz, my partner in crime who was stationed under the table. And if my mother happened to catch me, I would tell her I was just petting the dog. And she would believe me, because there were plenty of times when I really was just petting the dog. And over the course of so many years and so many meals, I never thought about how strange it was that I could be petting my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other. A pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent and sensitive and conscious as my dog. I never thought about the inconsistencies in my attitudes and behaviors toward these animals because, to be honest, when I was eating the pork chop, I didn't actually think I was eating an animal. I mean, sure, I knew on one level, whenever I ate meat, somebody had to die for my plate. But on another level, I just didn't connect the dots. I just had that, that knowing without knowing. I had a gap in my consciousness. And so because this gap in our consciousness blocks our awareness of the reality of our meat, it also blocks our authentic thoughts and feelings about our meat. Remember when I told you that you were eating a golden retriever? Chances are you couldn't help but think of the living animal, and you probably couldn't help but feel disgusted. And yet, when you believed that you were eating the flesh of a cow, you probably had no thought of the living animal and felt no disgust. And so when we are not aware of the reality of our meat or of our authentic thoughts and feelings about our meat, then we are also not aware that we have a choice, <laughs> that we are making a choice every time we eat meat. And so this gap in our consciousness robs us of our ability to make our choices freely because without awareness, there is no free choice. For much of my life, I never questioned my choice to eat pigs and chickens and cows and fish because I never even thought I had a choice. Nobody had ever asked me if I wanted to eat animals, how I felt about eating animals, if I believed in eating animals. No one had ever encouraged me to reflect upon this daily practice that had such profound ethical dimensions and personal implications. Eating animals was just a given. It was just the way things are. If you think about it, it's really striking that our culture teaches us to spend more time thinking about what brand of shampoo to buy than about what species of animals we eat and why. When our food choices have a significant impact on our bodies, our minds, and our world, truly, our food choices are a matter of life and death. And so now that we've talked a little bit about what the gap is, we can turn our attention to the next set of questions, which is, where does this gap come from? And what are its consequences? 
It was half a year before I started, uh, half a year, half a lifetime before I started asking these questions. It was 1989, and I had recently awoken to find myself hooked up to IV intravenous antibiotics at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston after having eaten what turned out to be my very last hamburger. According to my team of doctors, um, Beth Israel is a teaching hospital, so to my humiliation, I was assigned a cluster of young, good-looking interns that were fascinated with my intestinal activity, and I will say nothing else about that. And according to the Department of Public Health, which shut down the diner that I had made the mistake of eating at, I had eaten um, a hamburger that was contaminated with Campylobacter, which is a foodborne illness similar to Salmonella. Has anyone here ever had Campylobacter? You know what I'm talking about then. Okay, so just imagine if you haven't, imagine the worst gastrointestinal flu you've ever had times 10. That's what Campylobacter is like. So contracting Campylobacter was honestly one of the worst experiences of my life. But it was also one of the best experiences of my life because it was a turning point for me. Before I got sick, I had become increasingly uncomfortable with the idea of eating animals. Having witnessed on a handful of occasions information about the horrors of animal agriculture. I mean, I knew on some level that eating animals was antithetical to my personal values. Like most people, I cared about animals, and I didn't want them to suffer, especially when that suffering was so intensive and so completely unnecessary. And yet, I hadn't been ready to take that information in, so my response had always been, don't tell me that, you'll ruin my meal. But the Campylobacter really, um, in English we say, lit a fire under my butt. It really motivated me to change. After I got sick, I never wanted to eat another burger or, or any meat again. And I didn't. And then something interesting happened to me. When I stopped eating animals, I made the connection. I had a shift of consciousness. I had a paradigm shift. In other words, I didn't see different things. I saw the same things differently. Remember how different your meat looked to you when you thought it was a golden retriever? Well, that's how all meat suddenly looked to me. It's interesting how the gaps in our consciousness only become visible when they start to disappear. And as the gap in my consciousness closed, my mind opened. I wanted to learn the truth about animal agriculture. It was a truth that had been right in front of me, all around me, but that I had been unable or unwilling to see. And I wanted, I needed to understand how, when it came to eating animals, rational, caring people, just like myself, could, in the words of psychiatrist and social activist Robert J. Lifton, just stop thinking. So I spent about 20 years looking for answers, including about a decade of research that culminated in my doctoral dissertation on the psychology of eating meat. And what I found was to dramatically change the way that I and others working in psychology and social justice thought about this issue of eating animals. So to begin to share my findings with you, I want to do an exercise. If vegetarian is the term we use to describe an individual who follows the tenets, the teachings of the belief system or ideology we call vegetarianism, and vegan is a term we use to describe an individual who follows the tenets of veganism, what then do we call someone who is not a vegetarian or vegan? Anyone want to say? Don't be shy. It's so quiet. Thank you. Somebody who has not read my book, please. Okay. All the rest. All the rest? Oh, everybody else, right? 
So, well, sometimes you may have heard omnivore. I mean, this translates, I think, into, uh, very often we call somebody an omnivore if they're not vegan or vegetarian, or sometimes we use the term carnivore, right? But think about it. An omnivore, by definition, is an animal, human or non-human, that can ingest both flesh and plant matter. And a carnivore is an animal that needs to ingest flesh in order to survive. Both omnivore and carnivore describe one's biological predisposition, not one's ideological choice. Another common phrase we use is meat eater. But how accurate is this? I mean, meat eater describes a behavior as though it's divorced from a belief system. This is why we don't call vegans and vegetarians plant eaters because we recognize that the behavior of eating plants reflects a deeper belief system or ideology. We tend to assume it's only vegans and vegetarians who bring their beliefs to the dinner table. But most of us don't learn to eat pigs and not dogs because we don't have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. When eating animals is not a necessity for survival, which is the case in much, though not all, but much of the world today, then it is a choice. And choices always stem from beliefs. So what I found was that there is an invisible belief system that conditions us to eat certain animals. And this is the belief system I came to call carnism. Now, carnism is a special kind of belief system or ideology. It is a dominant ideology. That means it's invisible, it's entrenched, it shapes norms, laws, beliefs, behaviors, etc. And it's also a violent ideology. It's literally organized around violence. Meat cannot be procured without killing. And dominant violent ideologies, such as carnism, need to use a set of social and psychological defense mechanisms to enable humane people to participate in inhumane practices without fully realizing what they're doing. In other words, in other words, carnism teaches us how not to feel. Now, the primary defense of carnism is denial. If we deny there's a problem in the first place, then we don't have to do anything about it. Denial is expressed largely through invisibility. One way that carnism remains invisible is by remaining unnamed. If we don't name it, then we can't even think about it. We can't question it and we can't challenge it. The invisibility of carnism is why eating animals appears to be a given rather than a choice. But carnism also keeps its victims out of sight and therefore conveniently out of public consciousness. And as social critic, author, and eco-feminist Carol J. Adams tells us, if the problem is invisible, then there will be ethical invisibility. Now, carnism is an entire system of victimization. It victimizes all of us in different ways. But we t before we talk about the invisible victims of carnism, I want to do an exercise with you to give you a sense of the power and scope of invisibility. 124,000 farmed animals are killed globally every what? And this, by the way, is land animals. This does not include fish and sea creatures, which are uh, killed, but they're measured in pounds rather than individuals. Month? <laughs> Week? 124,000? It's a lot. Day? Any days? Good. Diversity is good. Thank you. Okay. Hour? Minute. If you guessed minute, you guessed correct. That adds up to approximately 65 billion land animals per year. So in the time it took us to do this exercise, 124,000 animals were slaughtered. But, I mean, think about it. Really think about it. 
How many farmed animals have you seen? How many have you seen just this week of this 65 billion? How many have you seen this month? How many have you seen this year? How many have you seen in your lifetime? I mean, just to give you some perspective, to put this number into some sort of perspective, think about how many people you see, how many humans you see every single day. And the farmed animal population is nearly 10 times the human population. So where are they? Given that these animals' body parts are literally everywhere we turn, why don't we ever see them alive? We don't see the animals whose bodies become our food because we're not supposed to. They are not, as carnistic industry would have us believe, living on happy mom and pop, happy family farms. I know this is supposed to be a happy cow, but it doesn't look like a happy cow, does it? It's a scary cow, but it's supposed to be a happy cow. But most animals today are not living on happy mom and pop farms, as we say in, in, in English, or family farms. Over 99% of the meat, eggs, and dairy that make it to our plates come from animals that were raised in factory farms. There are windowless sheds in remote locations that are virtually impossible for anyone other than industry officials to obtain access to. And if you did have tried to obtain access to one of these compounds, you could wind up in prison. For example, in the United States, we now have what's called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. This is a piece of legislation that is similar pieces of legislation are being passed in countries around the world today. Dara Lovitz, attorney and author of the book Muzzling a Movement, explains about the AETA that it states that one has committed the federal crime of terrorism if they engage in any activity that may reduce the profits of an animal enterprise. And she says the AETA and legislation similar to this is fundamentally unconstitutional as it violates activists' right to free speech. In the United States, we refer to these new sets of laws as ag-gag laws, agribusiness laws that prevent people from exposing any part of the practice of animal agriculture. So who are these individuals that carnistic industry tries so hard to hide from us? Well, I'm going to share a short video clip with you, narrated by animal behaviorist Jonathan Balcombe, who's the author of over 40 scientific papers and 40, four books on animal consciousness. And this gives us a rare glimpse into their inner lives. <coughs> These are intelligent, playful, and curious. Like us, they are also natural pleasure seekers. I often kneel down next to one of the adult pigs, maybe Fern or Rosie, lazing in the thick hay of their barn at Poplar Spring Animal Sanctuary. I scratch their heads and stroke their ears to let them know I'm a nice guy. Then I start to rub their belly. More often than not, the pig will make an effort to reposition him or herself, shifting several hundred pounds of weight to expose more of the belly for scratching and rubbing. This simple act says, that feels good. Sometimes they grunt with satisfaction. Their bellies are warm and very soft, and it's almost as much fun to administer the belly rub as it is to receive it. Almost. Cows form a strong emotional bond with their calves. For example, shortly after graduating from Cornell University Veterinary School, Dr. Holly Cheever was called out to a busy dairy when the cow mysteriously stopped producing milk. The cow had recently delivered her fifth baby out of the pasture. As was usual dairy farm practice, her calf was taken away as soon as she returned to the milking barn. Normally, the milk cow would produce over 12 gallons per day, but this cow always returned for the evening milking with an empty udder. Dr. Cheever couldn't figure out what was going on, but on the 11th day, the farmer called to say he had followed the cow out into the fields, where he discovered she had produced twins. Having lost four previous babies, the mother cow had made a Sophie's choice returning one of her precious children and keeping the other in the woods at the pasture's edge. She even pleaded with the farmer to let the cow keep her twin calf, but he was sent off to a veal crate. This incident invokes a cow's painful memory of earlier loss and the level of complex reason few would attribute to a cow. Chickens and turkeys are social species with well-developed vocabularies and calls. Each bird recognizes all the other individuals 
individuals in a flock by their appearance and by their voice. I remember watching a mixed flock of roosters who had recently been rescued from the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. They were happily foraging in the grass when suddenly they all made a dash to a nearby shed. Only as they reached cover did I notice a hawk flying overhead. Chickens and turkeys have specific calls for aerial predators, and one of them would sound the alarm. This is considered virtuous behavior because the alarm caller runs the extra risk of drawing attention to him or herself. Fishes are as misunderstood as they are diverse. Careful scientific experiments show that they experience pain. They also have emotions such as the fear of predators seen here. Fish can recognize other individuals, they have prodigious memories, and they have preferred shoal needs. Lobsters and crabs also show the experience of pain. Some crabs will refuse to accept food and eventually die after one of their claws is twisted off. Shrimp room body parts that were pinched or shocked and stopped doing so after treatment with a painkiller. Though we're still unraveling the mysteries of animal minds, there is no doubt that animals think and feel and that they have rich emotional and social lives. I know some of those scenes were lovely. Um, the animals that you saw, the, the land animals that were um, depicted here, are residents of Farm Sanctuary, which is the leading farmed animal protection organization. It's a sanctuary for abused and neglected farmed animals in the United States. Unfortunately, though, of course, Farm Sanctuary is home to only a tiny minority of farmed animals in the world today. So. In just a moment, I'm going to show another sh short video, four minute video, that gives a rare glimpse into the lives of the 99%. Now, this video that I'm going to show is distressing to witness, and I want to remind you that my goal here today is not to distress you, but to raise awareness. And to do that, I have to make the invisible <coughs> visible. I spent a lot of time selecting material that I felt was sufficient to inform without actually traumatizing you. And I also want to just remind you too that the focus of this presentation is ultimately solutionary. We explore the problem only in so far as that can help us explore ways to transform and transcend the problem. So I want to encourage you to push your comfort zone and bear witness to this four minute video clip because I do believe that the few seconds of discomfort will be well worth the empowerment that awareness ultimately brings. And this is feedback that I consistently get from people who attend my talks. But I also want to encourage you to witness yourself and if it's too much for you, close your eyes and plug your ears for the few minutes and I'll try to keep the sound low enough to block it out. I'm going to show you undercover footage in animal factories. Mother sows are locked in narrow metal stalls barely larger than their own bodies. Soon after birth, piglets are castrated by workers who cut into their skin and rip out their testicles. Next, the workers chop off their tails. Both of these painful procedures are nearly always done without anesthesia. Others are killed by being slammed headfirst into the ground. Once pigs have reached market weight, they are sent to slaughter. At the slaughterhouse, pigs are knocked in the head with a steel rod, hung upside down, and have their throats slit. Stunning condemns many pigs to having their throats slit while they are fully conscious and suffering. Because male chicks don't lay eggs and do not grow quickly enough to be raised profitably for meat, they are killed within hours after hatching. Male chicks are typically thrown into giant grinding machines while still alive. This practice is deemed standard and acceptable by the egg industry. The females have it even worse, destined for a life of prolonged cruelty. To reduce pecking induced by overcrowded living conditions, workers use a hot blade or laser to remove part of the chick's beaks. After the beaking, the birds are moved to cages where they will spend the rest of their lives. Nearly 95% of 
the paid laying hens spend their lives confined in tiny wire cages like this. Through genetic selection, chickens and turkeys raised for meat have been bred to grow so large so quickly that many suffer crippling leg disorders, chronic joint pain, and even fatal heart attack. Those who live to reach market weight are thrown into transport crates and loaded onto trucks bound for slaughter plants. At the slaughter plant, the birds are dumped from their crates, then roughly snapped upside down into moving shackles by their fragile legs. They are then pulled across a blade which slices their throats, causing blood to pour from their necks. Calves on dairy farms are dragged away from their mothers and violently killed, all so that humans can have the milk instead. <coughs> Subject young cows to painful mutilations and amputations. At a fraction of their natural lifespan, the so called spent dairy cows are prodded onto transport trucks and shipped to slaughterhouses. Unreliable stunning practices at the slaughterhouse condemn many cattle to having their throats cut and their limbs hacked off while still alive and conscious. Undercover investigations at kosher slaughterhouses in the United States have documented the routine practice of cutting open the throats of fully aware and alert cattle. Massive trawling nets indiscriminately drag hundreds of tons of fish and other animals along the ocean floor. They are then tossed on board where the surviving fish either suffocate or are crushed to death. Others are still alive when they are hacked apart on these floating slaughterhouses. Like factory farmed animals on land, farm raised fish are crowded by the tens of thousands in small disease and excrement ridden areas for their entire lives. When fish reach market weight, they are loaded onto tanker trucks and shipped to slaughter, where common killing methods include slow suffocation. It's only four minutes and it feels like a lot longer. I know, and good, good job. I know how hard this is to witness, I know. I've seen this and, and videos like this so many times and it never gets easy, never gets easy for me either. Um, I want to just remind you that much of what you have seen here are standard industry practices that apply to so-called organic and free-range facilities as well. Whenever people see footage like this, they always ask me, you know, Melanie, how is this legal? How is this legal? And I reply that not only is it legal, but there is an entire industrial complex organized around this kind of violence and slaughter. Animal agribusiness is a $125 billion per year industry in the United States alone. It's a multi-billion dollar industry around the world. I mean, there are countless companies like this one selling an emasculator, a castrator, as though it were a nail clipper. In fact, if you wanted to buy your own castrator, you could even find one on eBay, believe it or not. which is where I bought mine. Now before you make assumptions about what kind of person I am or what kind of woman I am, because I have a castrator in my purse, I, um, I know it's not good for my love life. Um, <laughs> I travel, I'm on the second year of a speaking, national speaking tour in the United States, speak, presenting my slideshow on carnism, so I'm on planes a lot. And I can't bring anything sharp and I can't bring anything too big, so I had to get a castrator. That's what I wanted to bring to my talks. But I am afraid that I'm going to keep forget this in my purse one day and be on a date or something. It's not good. But I'm, I'm happy to um, show you later if you want, but this is, this is what it looks like. 
So clearly, the animals pay dearly for our carnism. But as I mentioned, animals are not the only invisible victims of the system. Another group of invisible victims are the meat packers and slaughterhouse workers who have to work in a highly dangerous, death-saturated environment and not surprisingly have high rates of post-traumatic stress and addictions. I'm going to share with you two, just three titles of federal um, occupational safety and hazard accident reports from the United States to just give you a sense of what these people have to contend with. Can you see in the back? Too small? I'll read this out loud. Employee hospitalized for neck laceration from flying blade. Employee's eye injured when struck by hanging hook. Employee decapitated by chain of hide puller machine. In fact, in 2005, for the first time ever, Human Rights Watch issued a report criticizing a single US industry, the meat industry, for working conditions so appalling it violates basic human rights. And our environment is an invisible victim of carnism. According to the United Nations, animal agriculture is one of the most significant contributors to some of the most serious environmental problems facing the world today. And finally, we are the invisible victims of carnism. We pay for our carnism with our health as eating animal foods has been linked with the leading diseases in the Western world today. This is why the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, it used to be called the American Dietetic Association, issued a statement saying that not only are pure vegan, vegan uh, diets nutritionally adequate, but they're actually beneficial in the prevention and treatment of disease. We also pay for our carnism with our taxes, billions of dollars per year, millions I believe here in the United States, it's billions of dollars per year in meat subsidies. Subsidies that have been criticized across the political spectrum as one of the most egregious corporate welfare programs in the history of the world. And of course, we pay for our carnism with our hearts and with our minds. Because to eat the body of another sentient being, we have to block our awareness and shut down our empathy. And empathy and awareness are integral to our sense of self. We pay for our carnism with the gap in our consciousness. So we've talked a lot about denial expressed through invisibility. It's the primary sense of, uh, the primary defense of carnism. But think about it. Is invisibility alone really enough to maintain the system? Do you think invisibility alone can maintain the entire system? No, of course not. Hints of the truth surround us. The resilient vein in the drumstick, the pig on a spit at the company barbecue, vegan guests at dinner parties, and an endless array of dead animals everywhere we turn in the form of meat. So when invisibility inevitably falters, the system needs a backup. We need to be able to justify eating animals. The way that we learn to justify eating animals is by learning to believe that the myths of meat are the facts of meat. Now there is a vast mythology surrounding eating animals, but all of these myths fall under what I refer to as the three ends of justification. And I'm curious if you can guess what they are. Eating meat, eggs, and dairy is, I'm gonna, oh my God, that was really fast. I did start timing this with groups before. I heard all three of them. It's like within seconds. Normal, natural, necessary. and necessary. Yeah, I think this is the fastest group. I've, um, oh, okay, you get, you get the points for saying it. Um, I have done this exercise with thousands of people over the years, and people always know the answers. Why do you think we always get it? And I, not even people who have read my book. Right, we've heard it. We've heard this all before. These same arguments have been used to justify violent practices throughout the course of human history.
Now, let's just briefly look at each of these myths in turn. Eating meat is normal. Well, what we call normal is really simply the beliefs and behaviors of the dominant culture. It is the carnistic norm. And carnism as a social norm is so entrenched that it is virtually impossible to see unless we step outside of the carnistic box. We're stepping out of the box today. So to help you step outside of the carnistic box, I want to do another exercise. I'd like you to imagine, again, that you're at that dinner party where your host has just told you that you are eating a golden retriever. But now imagine that you tell your host how you feel. And she replies by telling you not to worry, not to feel bad, because the dog had a good life. She was able to run and play, and she formed friendships with other golden retrievers and even some people before she was killed at six months old. Does it feel any better eating the golden retriever? I had people sometimes say, no, now her friends miss her. I feel worse. So ask yourself if you would be opposed to a perfectly healthy golden retriever being killed simply because people like the way her legs taste. Why might you not be opposed to the exact same thing being done to somebody else. Carnism as a social norm is so entrenched that it blinds us to the fact that humane meat is a complete contradiction in terms. Humane meat is a myth. It is a myth constructed by those in the business of violence to appeal to those of us who would ordinarily never support such violence. Eating meat is natural. Well, what we call natural is simply the dominant culture's interpretation of history. It refers not to human history, but to carnistic history. It references not our fruit-eating ancestors, but their flesh-eating descendants. In other words, through carnism, we only look as far back in history as we need to, to justify current carnistic practices. And to be fair, murder, rape, and infanticide are arguably as long-standing, and therefore as natural, as eating animals. And yet, we don't invoke the longevity of these practices as a justification for them today. In the words of author Colleen Patrick Goudreau, do we really want to use the behavior of the Neanderthals as the yardstick by which to measure our current moral choices? And finally, eating meat is necessary. Well, when we, what we call necessary is simply what is necessary to maintain the dominant culture, to maintain the carnistic status quo. And here I'm going to let a picture speak for itself. Can you see in the back? Okay. Get the idea. Now, <laughs> a related myth is the protein myth. You may have heard this before. It's one of the most entrenched of the myths of meat, but it is a complete myth. In fact, did you know that you could be strong enough to lift a car even if you've never eaten an ounce of animal protein in your life? Really? I'm not kidding. Looking back on my own resistance to witnessing the truth about eating animals, I could see how the myths had a tremendous influence on me, as they do on all of us. I couldn't close that gap in my consciousness until I was ready to make the behavioral change that would inevitably follow. And I couldn't make that change until I felt safe enough to do so. I had a lot of fears and concerns. You know, would I get sick? Would I go broke buying expensive vegetarian foods? Would I have to subsist on a diet of tofu and cardboard? 
And this last issue was really a serious concern of mine because two of my greatest pleasures in life are cooking and eating. And what about my relationships? My father was, and he is today, a charter captain. My father is a professional fisherman. My uncle has been an avid hunter his entire life. My Jewish stepmother made the best matzo ball soup this side of the equator. My Italian nana thrived on stuffing us full of her lasagna marinara. And my half Lebanese mother served an Arabic lamb dish as the centerpiece of every special occasion. So what would happen if I rejected the traditions that bonded me to my family? What I didn't realize back then was that although change is always somewhat scary, and although changing ingrained behaviors is always somewhat challenging, that this kind of change would also be tremendously empowering. I didn't realize that I would be healthier today at 45 than I was when I was half my age at 22 and a half. I didn't realize that I would be able to cook and eat even more abundantly. And I didn't realize that the deepest bonds with others are forged not through unquestioningly following the dictates of tradition, but by becoming the kind of person who practices authenticity and integrity, the cornerstones, the foundation of meaningful relationships. John F. Kennedy once said that belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. JFK did not underestimate the power of myths, and neither should we, because the myths of meat prevail despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, and they prevail largely because the system is so entrenched. When a system is entrenched, that means it's embraced and maintained by all major social institutions, from the family to the state, that it's become self-perpetuating, as expressed in this quote from a 19th century French political economist. Can you see in the back, or should I read it? Read it? Okay. <laughs> When plunder becomes a way of life for men and women living together in society, they create for themselves a course of time, in the course of time a legal system that authorizes it and a moral code that glorifies it. And when we are born into an entrenched system such as carnism, we inevitably absorb that system's logic as our own. In other words, we internalize carnism. We learn to look at the world through the lens of carnism. And carnism uses a set of defenses that distort our perceptions of meat and the animals we eat so we can feel comfortable enough to consume them. For instance, carnism teaches us to see animals as objects so that we refer to this turkey as something rather than someone. Or we call this little baby an it, a thing, rather than he or she. Carnism teaches us to see animals as abstractions, as lacking any individuality, any personality of their own, and instead simply as abstract members of a general group about which we've made generalized assumptions. A pig is a pig, and all pigs are the same. And like other victims of violent ideologies, we give them numbers rather than names. This is summed up by a meat cutter who I interviewed for my doctoral dissertation who said to me, I don't think of farmed animals as individuals. I wouldn't be able to do my job if I got that personal with them. When you say individuals, you mean as a unique person, as a unique thing with its own name and its own characteristics, yeah? Yeah, I'd really rather not know that. I'm sure it has it, but I'd rather not know it. And carnism teaches us to place animals in rigid categories in our minds so that we can harbor very different feelings and carry out very different behaviors toward different species. For example, a female meat eater who I interviewed told me that she regularly consumes 
chicken, fish, pork, beef, etc., etc. And when I asked her if she ate veal, she stopped and she looked at me with an offended expression. And she answered, well, let's just say I came to your house and you told me that I had just eaten veal. I'd probably vomit, like I have to get that out of my system. And when I asked her why, she said, because veal comes from a baby and I can't eat a baby. And when we look at the world through the lens of carnism, we fail to see the absurdities of the system. So we see images like this or like this, someone mutilating their own body so that they can be eaten. And we take no notice rather than take offense. Or we see images like this or this, and we laugh rather than cry. Voltaire was right. If we believe absurdities, we shall commit atrocities. And carnism is but one of the many atrocities, one of the many violent ideologies that are an unfortunate part of the human legacy. And although the experience of each set of victims will always be somewhat unique, the ideologies themselves are structurally similar. The mentality that enables such violence is the same. It is the mentality of domination and subjugation, of privilege and oppression. It's the mentality that causes us to turn someone into something, to reduce a life to a unit of production, to erase someone's being. It is the might makes right mentality that makes us feel entitled to wield complete control over the lives and deaths of those with less power just because we can, and to feel justified in our actions because they're only savages, women, animals. It is the mentality of meat. And so if we fail to pick out the common threads that are woven through all violent ideologies, then we will be doomed to recreate atrocities in new forms. This is why it is critical that we incorporate all oppressive systems into our awareness, including carnism. Eating animals is not simply a matter of personal ethics. It is the inevitable end result of a deeply entrenched oppressive-ism. Eating animals is a social justice issue. Martin Luther King understood the ways in which oppressive systems reinforce one another. He wisely cautioned that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And the opposite is also true. Justice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. And justice is not an abstract concept. Justice is a practice. It is a practice that can be carried out anywhere. On the streets of the nation's capital, sometimes in a courtroom, in a university, and we can also practice justice on our plates. And so this brings us to our final question. Knowing what we do about carnism, what do we do about it? What is the solution to the gap? And I'm going to address this question with another question for you. Why do you think that we use carnistic defenses such as denial, avoidance, and justification in the first place? What's the reason, what's the purpose for the defenses? Any thoughts? I know nobody wants to speak out in front of the whole group. What's the purpose of all of these psychological games we play? All of it, yeah, all of the above. And it's absolutely true. The underlying reason is because people care. And tradition certainly plays a role. But the reason we use the psychological defenses is because people care. We care. We care about animals. And we care about the truth. And carnism depends on our not caring. And the system is built on deception. 
I have been speaking about the issue of eating animals for 20 years now, and I have never encountered a person who doesn't cringe when faced with images of animals suffering. So the good news is that carnism is a house of cards. It's a vulnerable system that needs a strong fortress to protect itself from its very own proponents, us. Why else would we need to go through all the psychological acrobatics if not because we care? And so our caring is both the problem and the solution. Our caring is what makes us want to turn away from the truth. But our caring is also what gives us the courage to face the truth, to bear witness. When we bear witness, we identify with another. To identify with another is to see something of them in ourselves and something of ourselves in them, even if the only thing we identify with is the desire not to suffer. When we bear witness, we empathize with another. We look at the world through their eyes. So when we make choices that impact them, we ask ourselves, what would he or she ask us to do? When we bear witness, we make the connection. We close the gap in our consciousness and we become more empowered because we become more integrated, more whole, more in alignment with our core values. Values such as compassion, reciprocity, the golden rule, and justice values that are diametrically opposed to carnism. It's no coincidence that integration and integrity share a root. Integrity, by definition, is the integration of values and practices. And we can practice witnessing in so many ways. Just think about, has anybody here seen this, the AIDS quilt? It's amazing, this massive, massive, miles-long AIDS quilt in the United States, we have the Vietnam Memorial Wall, the revolutionary music of the 60s, and now also the, the 2000s. Bearing witness or active witnessing can be writing or not writing a check in the name of justice. It can be creating an info stall. It can be standing on a street corner handing out pamphlets. It can be hosting or presenting or attending a slideshow. If you think about it, throughout the history of humankind, virtually every atrocity was made possible because the populace turned away from a reality that they felt was too painful to face. And virtually every social transformation, every revolution was made possible because a group of people chose to bear witness and they demanded that others bear witness as well. For instance, just consider the countless witnesses, the conscientious objectors throughout history, some who have been famous, but most who have been the unsung heroes of social transformation. This transformative potential of collective witnessing is why oppressive dominant systems must deny the truth about the social movements that challenge them. For instance, proponents of these movements are portrayed as biased and extremist when they challenge the biases and extreme practices of the dominant culture. Or they're portrayed as overly emotional or sensationalist when they challenge the apathy and numbing of the dominant culture. And the true power and scope of the social movement is minimized or obscured. And so this is why, despite what mainstream carnistic culture would have us believe, there is reason to be very, very hopeful. The vegan movement, which is the counterpoint to carnism, is thriving. For instance, since 2008 in the United States, the number of self-reported vegans and vegetarians has actually doubled. A recent Business Week article entitled The Rise of the Power of Vegans states that a growing number of America's most powerful bosses have become vegan. More and more leaders and celebrities are saying no to carnism. 
Ellen, is Ellen famous here? Ellen DeGeneres? Okay, I don't know how far her scope reaches, but she now has her own website entirely dedicated to going vegan. Vegan cookbooks and innovative foods and restaurants are popping up everywhere. So moving beyond carnism enables us to join a vibrant community of millions of people who seek to celebrate life and cultivate compassion. It enables us to become a part of something larger than our individual selves. And so coming full circle, back to me in the 1970s, Fritz, my first dog, was also in many ways my first teacher. Fritz taught me that love, which is the highest form of connection and the highest expression of justice, should not be limited by arbitrary boundaries such as species. To love someone is to respect their being. It's to respect that no matter how different from us they are, they have a life that matters to them. So Fritz taught me to be a witness. He taught me that love is a verb. And this is why the goal of the presentation today and the goal of my life's work has been to raise awareness of the violent system that is carnism because for better or worse, we are all participants in this system. So our choice really is not whether we participate, but how we participate. And with awareness, we can choose to be active witnesses rather than passive bystanders. With awareness, we can practice justice and exercise love. With awareness, we can lead more authentic and freely chosen lives and truly become, as Gandhi said, the change that we wish to see. Thank you. Wait, thank you.